Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. Mr. Williams, you may proceed. Since you haven't testified yet, Detective, can you tell us your full name and spell your last name? Benjamin Thorpe, T H O R P E. You are the lead homicide detective in this case in the investigation of the murder of the Lane Is that right? Yes. Um, did there come a point specifically in May of 2014 where you? went on television to ask for information regarding the investigation of this murder. Yes. Can you tell us why it was you went on TV at that time? If you remember the date, that would be helpful. Um, I don't remember the specific date. I want to say it was like mid-May or so, 2014. Okay. Um, I believe we had uh, collaborated with our crime line uh, entity and um, we were uh, putting information back out to the community uh, so that people didn't forget what we were doing and what we were investigating and still seeking help trying to find, find out what happened. I'm looking at a copy of your police report, help you remember the dates. Yes. Can I have a witness? <clears throat> Okay. So, you now remember what day Mr. Rosario was sentenced to prison in his other case? May 20th. And how long after he was sentenced was it that you uh, did this collaborative effort? Uh, probably about a week or so, maybe eight days. Okay. Uh, so, you collaborated and did you actually have a news conference that was covered by local media? Yes. Who was present to the best in the criminal network? Um, the best I can recall, I was, um, I believe someone from Crime Line was there. Um, I think maybe Miss Ortega's family was there. Uh, I think that's about it. All right. And do you recall what was said at that press conference that was broadcast? Uh, we released to the media that Juan Rosario and Sean Quinn were persons of interest uh, related to this homicide. All right. Anything else you can remember? Uh, we were also seeking any additional information from anybody that could help. Was the fact of his incarceration referenced to, to the public? Yes. Uh, in what fashion? Um, we, uh, we told the community through the media um, because it was our understanding we were getting information back from the community that um, Mr. Rosario and Mr. Quinn uh, had an element of fear throughout the community. And so we informed the community that they were no longer in the area. And if that made people feel better, that could come more readily with information. Um, that's why we did that. Did you tell the community he was no longer in the area, or did you say he's gone to prison? Um, I don't recall exactly what we said. I think it was referenced that he had been um, sentenced to the previous home invasion, and that's why he wasn't there. Okay. Do you know if you would have, or do you recall if you did reference the length of his incarceration? I don't believe so. I don't recall specifically that we said a certain number of years or anything like that. Okay. Anything else that you recall about that? Press well, did you speak at the press conference or was it somebody else? I believe I did. Um, I don't know if anybody else did as well. In response to that output of information to the community, did you receive some phone calls or at least one phone call with potential information regarding this murder? Yes. Near in time to the broadcast? I received one phone call 
the day after the broadcast, um, and then another phone call um, sometime later, maybe a week, 10 days. You recall who the first phone call was? Daniel Jobert. And if I go too far, please, uh, please let me know. The, the second phone call, remember who that was? The second phone call was, I believe her name was Kim Caldwell or Cantrell, something like that. Okay. And was she associated in any way with Janet Gutierrez? Yes. In what way? That's Janet's, I guess, mother-in-law, or it's the, Kim is the mother or the grandmother of Janet's um, grand, uh, children. Kim is the grandmother of Janet's children. Correct. So she would be the mother of the individual with whom Janet Gutierrez has a child. That's correct. All right. Um, you want to cross him on this? He hasn't, all he said is prison. It, and let's see. Let me get this straight. Uh, we informed the community if that made people feel better, they could come more readily with information. That's what I'm going to limit him to. Sure. Did you uh, have any indication that Janet Goodrich saw that broadcast? Uh, no, sir, I did not. I think absent uh, Ms. Goodrich seeing that broadcast, but it's not relevant. Response, Mr. Williams. To reiterate what I believe Ms. Gutierrez will testify to. I think I'd object to, I, I think we should probably talk about it. With the witness okay. There's a couple of things I need to tell the detective. Do not say the words home invasion on the stand. Okay? okay. Do not testify. I don't care what you think they're asking you. Do not testify to what Mr. Rosario went to prison for. You understand that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We'll give you more specific directions on what you're limited to, if anything, when you come back in. Okay. All right? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Now, in the June 17th recorded interview with Janet Gutierrez, that was taken by Detective Florida that I referenced in the state's opening, she says, I saw on the news he got 18 years in prison. So whether he remembers it or not, she's going to say that she saw it on the news and it was the number. And we met with her again last night, and she reaffirmed that that was a truthful and actual statement. When I keep saying that that's my understanding, that's what it's based on. And that's been, of course, provided in the discovery. As long as the state can tie it up, um, the detective obviously cannot say home invasion, as I just instructed him. Um, he can say that in the news conference they informed the community that Mr. Rosario had been sentenced to prison, and he can say that they did that so that people would feel comfortable coming forward. But at no point has he said or used the terminology, feel safe. So you're going to need to rephrase how you keep saying it, Mr. Williams. I will do that. And, okay. Your Honor, it would be my intention, for the benefit of everybody, to lead him with those questions and have him answer yes or no. I think that probably would be the safest thing to do. Mr. Whedon? I will not object. All right. And, and just so the court knows, he's not going to testify to any of that when he testifies here in a moment. He's well, I'm so glad call. that we I'm so glad that we spent the last 10 minutes on well, this then. He will eventually, but <laughs> that's fine. Not this we actually need to clarify it. Um, so, have all the jurors gotten a break? Yes, yes. Just make sure that they're ready to come back in the courtroom and then let me know. There's 18 of them, so we need to make sure. We're not bringing them right back in. He's just going to let me know if they're ready to come back. What's up?
in which he says, uh, line 25, a few, day, a few days ago, my mother-in-law said she got a call from the detective that I needed to talk to you about. What happened? I asked him what happened. So her, I think it's a misrepresentation because if you read on her interview, transcript interview, you read the first page, she doesn't talk about Gentlemen, can I interrupt for a moment? If this isn't going to come up this morning, let's go ahead, get the jury back in, go through what's going to come up this. Is this going to come up this morning? I don't anticipate it coming up. Okay, now. let's put table this for right now since I have a jury waiting, and sure. we'll get back to it. In the meantime, someone give me a transcript of Janet Gutierrez's interview, please. Bring jury. Back. Hope you're refreshed after your okay, call your next witness. They call Detective Benjamin for Yes, ma'am. You may inquire. Thank you. Can you please tell us your full name and spell your last name for the record? Benjamin Thorpe, T H O R P E. Where are you currently employed, sir? I currently work for the Orange County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been a member of the Orange County Sheriff's Office? I've worked for the Sheriff's Office a little over 13 years. What is your current title and assignment for the Sheriff's Office? Currently, I am a supervisor with our major case unit, uh, specifically our sex crime squad. Could you briefly walk us through your career with the Sheriff's Office? In other words, the first assignment you had until where you are today. Okay. I started with the Sheriff's Office in 2004. I was a uniformed patrol deputy. Um, I worked most of the sectors. Uh, I began in Sector 4, which is the South Orange Blossom Trail area. I worked over on the east side near UCF. I've also worked in the Pine Hills area. Um, from patrol, I left the road to become a detective in our sex crimes unit. I was in our sex crimes unit as a working detective for about three and a half years. From our sex crimes unit, I left and became a detective with our nighttime violent crime squad. Essentially, uh, that squad um, works any violent crime that happens at night um, up to, uh, I mean, robberies, <clears throat> persons crimes. If somebody's hurt really bad at night, uh, we investigated it. Um, from our night investigation squad, I then took a position as a detective within our homicide unit. I was there for a little over two years. Um, I got promoted out of homicide, became a road patrol supervisor, uh, uh, supervised a group of 10 to 12 deputies on the road, as well as managed the um, field training um, squad for that sector as well. And currently I'm back up in our sex crimes unit as a supervisor there. So you referenced two years that you spent in the homicide unit. Did that two years encompass September 18th of 2013? Yes, sir, it did. And did you become a lead detective in a homicide investigation with a victim named Elena Ortega on that day? Yes, sir. How is it that you became assigned a lead detective for that case? In other words, how are uh, homicide investigations assigned within that unit? So when I was in the homicide unit for the sheriff's office, um, there are three teams uh, assigned to the squad itself. Uh, within the unit, 
um, those teams rotate in on-call status. So uh, for my team, we were on call for a week at a time, um, and then I had three additional partners. So I had there was a total of four detectives on my team, a supervisor, which was the corporal. Um, for that week that we were on call, um, the days were broken up as to who the detective was on call for that day. So I may have a Monday, Tuesday call rotation, my partner would have a Wednesday, Thursday, and then the other detective would cover Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then through that rotation, um, we rotated who was going to be the primary detective for the next homicide that occurred. And it was your day on the morning of September 18th? For the next homicide, yes, sir. Now, once you were notified of the homicide, did you respond to the scene on the morning of the 18th? Yes, sir, I did. And where was the scene located? I responded to 5020 Turnbull Drive. And is that in Orange County, Florida? Yes, sir. Why were homicide detectives called out in that particular instance? Um, there was a deceased female that was discovered at that residence. Are you, are homicide detectives called out every time there's a deceased individual? Most of the time, yes, sir. Even for things that turn out not to be homicide? That is correct. And what portion of Orange County is that address at? The, I guess the most, if you're not familiar with the totality of Orange County, uh, the biggest landmark is down near the uh, Orlando International Airport. Uh, so the biggest intersection that I give people is uh, Cimarron Boulevard and Hoffner Avenue. Were you familiar with that sector? Have you worked there before? Yes, sir. I, that's where I started my career. That's where I was as a patrol supervisor. Uh, so I am familiar with the area. What did you observe when you first arrived on scene? When I arrived on scene, I noticed that there was um, crime scene tape that was spread around the area. Uh, I noticed a number of fire apparatus, um, fire trucks, uh, firemen doing different uh, tasks. Uh, there were patrol deputies that were on scene doing different tasks as well. Do you remember approximately what time it was you arrived that morning? Uh, I think it was shortly after 8, 7.30, 8 o'clock, somewhere around there. Were any other detectives working with you at the scene that morning? Yes, sir. Who was that? My partner, uh, Detective Scott Brunsma, was there. Um, Detective Kevin Wilson came out later on. Um, I believe Detective Dave Phelan, who was one of my other partners. Um, and I believe uh, maybe Detective uh, Corporal Jason McMullen was there as well. So what is it that you did that morning to sort of begin your investigation? Could you walk us through the steps you took? The first thing I did was meet with the uh, primary deputy on scene. Uh, who briefed me on what had transpired thus far. Do you recall who that person was? Yes, sir. Who was that? That was Deputy Sheriff Philip Engstrom. So he said he sort of gave you a rundown of what had happened and then he allowed you to go from there? Yes, sir. Did you take statements from any initial reporters? I did not. Do you know who took those statements? I believe Deputy Sheriff Philip Engstrom uh, collected statements from uh, most of the primary people. Uh, he may have had an assistance from another deputy, but I'm not sure. Did you notify or ask anyone else to respond to the scene who wasn't already there? Yes, sir. And who was that? Or who were those persons? I requested that our crime scene investigators respond, uh, and that was uh, crime scene investigator Joanna Fletcher. Um, and then I also uh, requested that the state fire marshal respond to the scene as well. And why did you ask about the state fire marshal? Because in addition to the deceased body being found at this residence, there was also a significant fire set to the residence. Now, prior to entering the scene, did you speak to any witnesses who had been standing around? Yes, sir. And who were those witnesses? I spoke with Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Collins, Sarah and Johnny Collins, and also Abraham Madeira. And did you take a brief verbal statement from Mr. Madeira? Yes, I did. Did you eventually confer with the fire marshal? Yes, I did. Where did that occur? Uh, in front of the residence. Did you ever see or were you present when he made entry into the residence? Initially, I was not present, or I was not present when he entered the residence. Did you ever go inside the residence that morning? I did. With him or with somebody else? I went inside uh, with the state fire marshal as well as our crime scene investigator, Joanna Fletcher. Was that in order for him to brief you on what he had found? Yes, sir. 
What observations did you make of the inside of the residence? Um, the inside of the residence was, uh, there was no power. Uh, it was dark. Um, very heavy smell and stench of smoke. Um, significant amounts of water uh, everywhere. Uh, very significant fire damage as well. Soot, um, insulation strewn about the house. Um, it was uh, it was damaged pretty well. Okay. When I approached the witness, must have been previously marked as case exhibit D. Can you show me how? You may. From the composite states exhibit D at the form that's four photographs, would you look at the <laughs> Okay. Do you recognize the images depicting these photographs? Yes, sir. And what do you recognize in the paper? Those photographs are pictures of the inside of 5020 Turnbull Drive. Do they appear to be fair and accurate depictions of the residents that you saw that morning? Yes, sir. This time, the state would ask the court to admit states exhibit D as state five. Any objection? No objection. This will be admitted without objection as states exhibit number five. Commissioner, publish states five. Yes, sir. Later, part in front of the detective, and I'm putting the photographs up on the screen. If you could just sort of tell us what we're looking at in each image. <clears throat> okay. Um, this is the this red door right here is the front entrance to uh, 5020 Turnbull. Um, we're looking straight through the house from the front to the back. This is a sliding glass door that leads to the backyard. Uh, over here to the right is the kitchen. Um, this area where the couch is, is a living room. Um, and then uh, to the left here is a hallway that goes down to some bedrooms. That was number one, States Exhibit 5, now publishing. Number two, States Exhibit 5. Okay. <clears throat> this photograph is, so essentially the previous photograph, if you stepped into the house, a couple steps, um, you would be just past the uh, kitchen that was on the right-hand side. And so this is the living room. This is that white couch that I said. Um, here's the sliding glass door that leads to the backyard and back side of the house. Um, over here is a uh, uh, coffee table. Um, there's like a china cabinet or a hutch over here with a TV uh, console center as well. All right, so from the last photograph that we just looked at, um, if, you know, from when we had walked into the house, if you stopped right there and turned 90 degrees to the left, we'd be looking down the hallway that I indicated was off to the left. So here's that white couch that was in the living room. This is us looking 90 degrees down that hallway where I indicated um, some bedrooms were. Uh, there's a bedroom that's here. There's a bedroom here. There's a bedroom back here. Uh, there's a closet right here. Um, and then a bathroom right here. And finally, the fourth photograph of States Exhibit 5. So if you walk down the hallway, to where it stops. This is the last bedroom on the right. Um, this uh, window leads out. This window leads out to the back side of the residence. Um, bed here, to the right of this bed, um, there's a. It leads to a uh, master bathroom. Um, there's a closet that's right over here. This is a um, dresser with uh, drawers and things like that, a large mirror that's right here. Is it your understanding, or what is your understanding as to who occupied that bedroom? Um, my understanding is this is the uh, bedroom where Miss Elena Ortega spent most of her time.
What observations did you make of that bedroom when you went inside? The bedroom was sig significantly damaged as well. Um, some of the dresser drawers were pulled out, strewn across the room. Um, heavy water damage, heavy smoke damage. Um, and then on the bed itself, there was a significant amount of body fluid, blood that had pooled, drained down from the top mattress down to the side to the box spring um, of that bed. Now, did you remain on scene most of the morning? Most of the morning, yes, sir. Eventually, did a member of uh, the victim's family arrive on scene? Yes, sir. And who was that person? Uh, we identif or I, I identified her as Elena Wilson. That is the daughter. And was it your responsibility to inform her of her mother's passing? Yes, sir, it was. Did you conduct an interview with her at the same time? Yes, sir, I did. And at this time, the state would ask the court to admit states to the F as page six and ask the court to read the same. Any objection, Ms. Sweden? No. This will be admitted without objection as states exhibit number six. Yeah, Ladies and gentlemen, the assistant state attorney, M. Ryan Williams, and defendant Juan Rosario, as well as the attorney for the defendant, Roger Whedon, stipulate that the identity of the deceased found by law enforcement in the residence at 5020 Turnbull Drive in Orlando, Florida on September 18th, 2013, and upon whom Dr. Sarah Zydowicz performed an autopsy on September 19th, 2013, is Elena Ortega. Because the, the defense and the state have stipulated to the identity of the victim, this fact should be considered as true in your deliberations. Cross. Thank you, You were only in the house about 15 minutes later. Yes, sir. And uh, you personally don't collect evidence, correct? That is correct. That's at the crime scene investigator? Yes, sir, that's correct. And you don't make decisions or arrive at opinions about the origin of the fire, those kind of things, correct? That is correct. You depend upon the uh, fire marshal to do that, right? Yes, sir, I did. But did you look and see if there was any fire accelerants around there, like gas cans, anything of that nature? Um, Casually, as I looked through the house, um, nothing jumped out at me. And uh, you indicated there was significant damage? Yes, sir. The, house. The, uh, the property damage, you don't know how much was caused by the firefighters as opposed to the fire, do you? No, sir, I do not. Redirect. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, you don't collect evidence, but you did speak to Ms. Fletcher, correct? Yes, sir. Did the two of you have a conversation or multiple conversations about what you believe the pertinent physical evidence might be? Yes, sir. Is it a fair statement that you worked with her to ensure that everything was collected that needed to be? Yes, sir. But she actually did the actual collecting from it? She physically collected what? we determined to be important. We gave you an hour. Yes, sir. No further questions. Thank you. He is subject to recall. All right, Detective, you're excused for now, but you're subject to recall, so you remain under subpoena. Yes, ma'am. Call your next witness. State calls Abraham Madeira. Abraham Madeira. M-A-D-E-R-A. -E and what's your address, sir? Right now I live in Kissimmee. Okay. 
Yes. Yeah. That's good enough. I lived in 5912 Sunderland Drive. I'm sorry. 5912 Sunderland Drive. Mr. Madeira, could you please speak up just a little bit? Because yes, ma'am. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Take your time to try to relax, okay? Yeah. Um, Sunderland Drive, is that anywhere near Turnbull Drive? Yes, sir. Can you tell us where in relation to Turnbull Drive your address back in September of 2013 was located? It's four houses down from the main road of Turnbull. Very close. Yes. How long did you live there? Six years. So I want to take you back to the morning of September 18th of 2013, the day that there was a fire in your neighborhood. Do you remember that day? Yes. Now, did you speak to detectives that morning? No. Do you remember giving a written statement to the detectives? They asked for information round. Yes, sir. Yeah. Did you yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, had you gotten up early that morning? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, well, that morning I had to take my father there to work. It was only one vehicle for transportation. Okay. So I dropped them off during the morning, sometime between 4 50, 5 o'clock. Okay. Now, did you have to drive past the corner house on Turnbull, uh, 5020 Turnbull Drive, on your way to drop your father off? Yes, sir. When you left your house, take your father, did you see anything amiss or wrong with that house? No, sir. Any smoke coming from it? No, sir. And you said you were taking your father to work. What type of work did he do? Uh, he's a semi-truck driver. So you were taking him to his truck? Yes, sir. Do you know how long you were there with him in the truck? That's uh, roughly like 15, 20 minutes. When you dropped him off, did you have to drive back past 5020 Turnbull Drive in order to go back to your house? Yes, sir, I did. And you started to say approximately what time it was it that you drove back past 5020 Turnbull? Between 510, 520s, sometime around there. And when you drove back past between 510 and 520, was there any smoke? No, sir, not at all. It was only later when you woke up earlier in the morning you sure, realized. Sure. Sustained. When did you first realize that there was smoke at that residence or that something had happened there? Uh, pretty much when I heard like sirens of like a fire truck and police okay. come to the neighborhood. Did that wake you up out of your sleep? Yes, sir. And did you go to the scene and observe what occurred? Yes, like when I woke up, I just, you know, there's everybody running around through the area. I just pretty much walked out and I just saw like the road was blocked off. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Cross. You're cross. All right, sir. Is this, is this witness free to go? He is in the police. All right. Thank you, sir. You're free to go. Thank you. Call your next witness. State calls Elena Wilson. You approach, sir.
call your next witness. Is she here? She's my mother. I want to talk to you about an address, the address being 5020 Turnbull Drive. Now, is the house that is located at that address, has that been in your family for a long period of time? Yes, he has been. Who within your family has lived at that residence? I did. I moved here with my son. Um, and then my parents remain in New Jersey, but my father bought the house. So I was, I just ended up just paying the mortgage. Um, and then they actually retired and came and leave uh, mom and dad with me at that house and my son together. And then I was transferred with my job to Atlanta, Georgia. So I had to move and then they remain in the house ever since. When you refer to they remain in the house ever since, are you talking about your mother and your father? Yes. At some point, did your mother begin to live at that residence by herself? Yes, she did. Actually, my father's health started uh, deteriorating, so he actually ended up um, in a nursing home. Um, so then she stayed at the house by herself. With your mother staying in the house by herself, did that cause you to have any concerns about her safety? Absolutely. Um, Myself and my husband told my mom many times to come and live with us, and she just didn't want to leave that house that they left, that they had lived for so many years. And then she was close to my dad because he was right there at Uncurry Ford at the nursing home. So she wanted to stay close to him because she would go and visit him every day. So she would never move. So the fact that she wouldn't move out of the house and live with you. Um, did you, as her daughter, make sure that, that she was as safe as possible? Absolutely. Um, I actually was telling my husband the other day. It's the state. Uh, did your mother lock the door, uh, and was she good about locking the door uh, at night? She did, and actually I called her every night, and I always asked her the things that we used to go through. Mom, did you like the door? Did you put the chain, you know, and did you leave the light on? And I make sure she was going to be okay in that house by herself every single day. I want to direct your attention to September 18th of, of 2013. How old was your mother at that point? She would have been 83, and her birthday, she would have been 84, November 19th. On that day, on September 18th of 2013, did your mother have any particular health issues that, that she was going on, any recent surgeries, things along those lines? She did. She was a pretty ill lady. She actually had a hip replacement, um, and she also had a stomach uh, surgery. Uh, on top of that, she was diagnosed with osteoporosis, so her bones were deteriorating. So she had to use a walker, and every time I took her to the doctor, she couldn't walk too long, so I made sure I put that uh, wheelchair in my trunk and, um, and then just take her that way, because she couldn't walk. When was the, the stomach surgery that you had referenced? In, in relation to that date, and not particular date, but was it something that was recent? I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was maybe the beginning of the year she had the stomach surgery. And when was the hip replacement surgery? The hip replacement was um, like the year before, which I believe it was in 2012. That's when she had it. And in terms of her being mobile, you had indicated that there was a wheelchair as well as walkers. 
Uh, did you place multiple walkers in her house? I did. I got her two walkers. One was in the bedroom right next to her night table because she needed it to go from the bedroom to the bed to the bathroom. Um, and then I put one in the living room because that way she can have either or available to her in case she needed it. So I had one there when she was in the kitchen. She had the other one on the other side of the house. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of her property um, that was at the house. Did your mother have um, suitcases that were, um, I guess, housed in the house there? She did. She had um, multiple suitcases, and she used to keep always her fabrics and everything in there uh, right, right on the closet. When you indicated her, her fabrics, is that for sewing? Yeah, she was a seamstress. Okay. In terms of what the suitcases look like, do you have a recollection of the exterior of the suitcases that she owned? Yeah, one I remember it was it was really like old. We had it forever and ever. It was kind of like a yellow with a big thing that just went across and he had a belt on it. And there was another one that it was kind of like a fabric material and it was with flowers, like a green color with flowers and she also had that one as well. Do you know where she kept those suitcases? She kept them in the closet, right in her bedroom. Did your mother also keep cash in the house? She did. Um, she she kept some cash. I mean, you know, they really never had it much, but she kept some cash that she actually always told me where it was, she said, for me to know, and it was like always in two frames on her dress. You mentioned two frames on her dresser. Um, do you have a brother? I do. Okay. The, the frames that she kept on her dresser, I'm assuming that those are photo frames? Yes, it was a picture of me and a picture of my brother on each side of the dress. You mentioned and, that she put the cash in the yeah. back of the frame. Yeah, she. Oh, go ahead. She put the cash always in the back of the frame because that way she, she always thought it would be hard for somebody if they came to. I'm sorry. That's okay. Do, do you mean in a minute? Are you okay? I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. Are you do you want a minute? I'm fine. Okay. Just talking about, about the cash, real brief. In terms of how it would go in the back of the frame, was it just straight cash or was it in an envelope? Or it was in an envelope and every time she like she took money out for anything. She put like a minus on the amount she took and then it balanced. She put like a minus if she took any money, cash money up or whatever, and then she kept on the balance of that right outside that envelope so of how much she had left in the envelope. So she would do it, the accounting on the envelope? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to bring your attention to September 17th of 2013. Now, on the 17th, did you speak to your mother? I speak with my mother every day, during the day and at night. Yes, I did. Do you recall approximately what time you spoke to her that night? We actually talked for a long time that night. Um, um, uh, maybe about 45, an hour, maybe. I was cooking in, in the kitchen, I remember. Uh, and then um, I was making a dish to bring to her the next morning and pick up my dad to come and have lunch with us on that morning of the 18th. So you had plans with her the following day? Yes. <laughs> now taking you to the morning of the 18th, did you receive phone calls from the neighbors at your mom's address? I received a phone call from a lady yeah, the neighbor and told me that her house was, a smoke was coming out. Upon receiving that phone call, did you arrive at your mom's residence? Yes. 
Did you ever speak to your mother again? <laughs> no. But Thank we'll you. one day. Take it. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. I have no further questions at this time. Cross. Did the neighbor that called you, she, she, is this someone that helped after your mom? I'm sorry. The neighbor that called you, is this someone that helped look after your mom? The, the neighbor that called me what? You said if, some, if a neighbor called you about this song? A neighbor called me, yes. Was that someone you knew? I didn't know. I think she lived like a couple of houses down from my mom. Did people in the neighborhood help you look after your mom? Did you have anybody in the neighborhood that helped you with that? Well, I had a, a lot of neighbors help me because a lot of neighbors that knew my mom loved my mom so anytime I called them for anything they were there and if many times I called neighbors that I said I cannot my mom is not answering the phone will you please make sure and they would go knock on the door and I say your daughter is trying to call you because I called her every night to make sure she would answer the phone so yes every neighbor knew my mom I'm sorry there were people that neighbors that knew you and your mother mm hmm Who would help get her money? I'm sorry? The cash money that she had in the house, how would she get the cash money? How did she get the cash money? Yeah. Well, I mean, they had Social Security. So, you know, so they get money and then she would do. Would cash the checks for her or would someone else cash Sometimes them? I help her cash the checks. But she always would come with me and I would take her to uh, the bank or whatever and I would just take her and she'll catch it. And who else would help her cash the checks? Just me. Was there somebody else though, that helped her with the finances, with the cash and the money? It's just me. How about Christopher Vargas? Did he help out also? I'm sorry? Christopher Vargas? Christopher Vargas? Vargas. No, and if I remember, Christopher, is he the young boy? Um, he actually just helped my mom any time she needed something, but he never helped my mom with finances. He was just there in case she needed him to cut the grass or whatever. Would she give him money from time to time? Whenever he actually help her, absolutely. The suitcases, uh, you said that she kept those in a closet? She did. Which closet was that? I believe it was in her bedroom, and she had some other suitcases in the sewing room. Would that be the closet right outside of her bedroom? No, that would be the closet in her bedroom. She had suitcases for everything, so she had some suitcases in her bedroom closet, and she had suitcases in the sewing room. And I think she had one in the closet hallway as well. Redirect. No, he was just, um, my mother and my father knew him. He was a young boy, if that's the one I'm thinking of, very young uh, individual. And he would just help my mom, especially when she started being alone in sewing, the, uh, cutting the grass or whatever she needed to do. Doing the, the physical stuff to help out around the house? Yeah, because okay. I couldn't, I worked, so as my husband, so he was there to help her. Okay, thank you very much. No further questions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wilson, your no, excuse. I have another question. I don't, is this something new that was brought up on redirects? I don't normally allow recross. I've gone yeah. over this with you. All right, one question. One question. Go. You said he'd help cut the grass? Well, he helped her with anything she needed. That was just an example I was giving. He would also go pay her electric bill with me sometimes. Pay her electric bill? Yeah. Not that I know of. Anytime she needed money orders, because she never really liked checks, I would always go and get them at Amscott or at the bank, and she would come with me. Would she have Christopher Vargas get money orders for her also? I didn't know that. I don't know. Can't answer that. She always called me anytime she needed, that she said she had to pay her bills, and she always reached me for that. You recall uh, giving an interview with Detective Thorpe? If I what? Do you know Detective Thorpe is in this case? Detective Thorpe, yes. Ben Thorpe. Do you, you recall giving an interview with him? 
I did the day, uh, the same day when that happened. And do you recall, look at page 35, line 8. Do you recall telling Detective Thorpe that Christopher got money orders? Well, I mean, I don't remember that. May, may I Whether he did or didn't. May I you Have you shown this to the state? You can approach. Well, I don't remember. A lot have happened since, so. A lot has happened since, so I don't remember. That. He might have helped her a few times. I don't remember that. Redirect. No, I didn't. All right. Ma'am, your excuse for now, but you're still under subpoena and subject to being recalled. So you need to remain in the vicinity of the courthouse. All right? Thank you, ma'am. You can step down. up a little bit early this morning so I'm I'm gonna send you to lunch until we're gonna start back up at 145 I have some legal issues I need to discuss with the lawyers so I'll do it now since we've taken a quick break and we'll be back in session at 145 see you then have a good lunch don't look at anything over lunch okay right. leave your notepads on the chairs please <laughs> Turning to the issue of um, Detective Thorpe's testimony as to the TV conference, I've looked through Ms. Gutierrez's tape statement. If you look on page 52, line 21 through 23, she talks about having seen this scene on te television that he got 18 years, he being Mr. Rosario, got 18 years in prison. And I'm, I'm going to quote her. This is starting at line 20. Well, you know what, I'm gonna start at line 18, in the middle. Why I have to do this, because I'm going to go to jail, because I bury this shit. You know I try to cover it up for him, so that you're safe and I'm safe, and I'm go going to hold it in so that I don't tell anybody, so that we're safe, and then when he gets 18 years, and I see it on the news, my mother-in-law asked me about it, and I just spill my guts to her because I held it in for so long I couldn't tell nobody. It ends at line 23. State, you can have your copy back. So, uh, Mr. Whedon, your objection to the officer um, testifying to what he said is overruled as she did see the press conference according to her own tape statement. Anything else we need to discuss about that? The state still wants to reopen the issue of whether or not I'm going to allow someone to testify to the fact that he got 18 years. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. I thought you indicated that at the bench. I did for two reasons. The first reason is the nature of the opening statement that the defense counsel gave, which, as I indicated at the bench, I believe fits squarely within the reasoning of Williamson. And I'm sorry for restating, but I know we're making a record. And Williamson, the court latched on to the fact that that case was highly dependent upon one witness's testimony and the credibility of that witness's testimony 
and the entire defense opening was a attack on the credibility of Janet Gutierrez. The situations are very similar. I do believe that Mr. Whedon, by his opening statement alone, has made the details, not the home invasion, but the significant length of time that he got relevant. Uh, I, I certainly understand if the court wants to do a proffer with Ms. Gutierrez before she testifies, um, but that is the state's position at this point. Yes. yes. Judge, in my view of everything we know so far, that she didn't call Detective Thorpe because she saw something on the news, she called Detective Thorpe because her mother-in-law, she, whom she called her mother-in-law, this Kim woman, told her um, th that she had gotten called from the detective and that she needed to do something about it. She didn't, she didn't say what happened. And so my, my position is that her making a phone call was not in response to anything on the news or any response to no longer being in fear, in response to her mother's, what she called her mother-in-law, telling her she needs to do something. Um, the interpretation of, of why why she did what she did after she was she saw this on the news is something that both sides can argue. I, I've never heard her testify, but what I see in that statement is she says, I saw it on the news and I spilled my guts to my mother-in-law skipping significant portions of what she said. Um, she saw he got 18 years. Um, clearly, that was part of the motivation she had for coming forward, according to the statement she made to Detective Thorpe. I'm not going to quote the entire statement. Um, it's pages and pages of, of things that she said, but she makes a lot of statements in that transcript about um, being threatened by Mr. Rosario, prior to that and that she wasn't talking because he told her um, he was going to hurt her and her sister if she said anything. I mean, there's a lot in that transcript leading up to the moment where she says when she saw on the news he'd gotten the 18 years, she spilled her guts to her mother-in-law because she'd been holding it in for so long. So there's enough there for me to allow this to come in. Now, on the subject of the 18 years, I mean, clearly, the, the detective doesn't remember saying 18 years, so he can't testify to that. The issue has become whether Ms. Gutierrez can testify to the 18 years. Um, I will reread Williamson. My issue with Williamson, Mr. Williams, was um, that that case was slightly different than this one um, in its facts, and you have to be very careful with these because they're very fact specific. But I will reread Farrell and Williamson. Um, we'll need a proffer of what she would say. And so we can handle that this afternoon before she testifies. All right, um, state's gonna make, you guys have made arrangements, you're gonna make Ms. Gutierrez available to Mr. Whedon so he can chat with her. Yes, Judge, she'll be at the state attorney's office at 12.30 p.m. Okay, anything else we need to discuss prior to recessing? Not from the state. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll see everybody at 145 in recess.